my loves! Welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel if you are new here. Hi, hello, my name is Loie, and I have a bit of a very guilty confession to make. Until about two days ago, I had never watched The Blair Witch Project. I know, I know, it is a sin atonable only by death for someone who makes the kind of content on the internet that I do. But the other night, as I often do when I am drifting off into a melatonin-induced sleep, I was thinking through various video ideas, and a thought popped into my head on making a video on the earliest alternate reality game, or spooky series, or ARG, or unfiction piece. The list could go on and on of phrases and words that I could use for the kind of content that I usually talk about here on my channel. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today, the Blair Witch Project, and the the viral, which back in 1999, viral was not the same as it is now, today in 2020. Marketing, technique, campaign, alternate reality game series, whatever. But even though we are taking a look at the Blair Witch Project today, it is actually not the earliest alternate reality game or series um, of its kind. There are examples from the early 90s of kind of the first attempts at an ARG. And then as I was thinking back, I thought back on the 1938 uh, War of the Worlds alien invasion radio show that went out that had everybody fooled and thinking aliens were going to come and uh, attack and take everyone away. And so what I'm getting to is that this is not the earliest alternate reality game, but my god is it a freaking interesting piece. Now the Blair Witch Project had somewhat of a cult following by the time that it went to Sundance Film Festival back in the 90s. Eventually from there it was purchased and put into theaters for a wider release. This film had somewhere around like a 35000 to 65000 I want to say, dollar budget and grossed hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office. For good reason. People were convinced this was real. And the website, BlairWitch.com, has a lot to do with it, in my humble opinion. So today we're going to be taking a look at it together, um, really deep diving into it. I'm, I'm kind of doing this video live alongside with you, but I have dug into all of this previously. I just think the easiest way to go through everything is on my computer right next to you. Alright, so upon visiting the Blair Witch Project website, we have a myriad of sounds uh, that like to play right in your ears, um, which is super fun. So we have four sections, mythology, the filmmakers, the aftermath, and the legacy. Now starting off here at mythology, I would say this is the most detailed part of the Blair Witch website. We have a timeline starting back in February of 1785 going all the way up to October 16th of 1997. So back in February of 1785, several children accuse Ellie Kedward of luring them into her home to draw blood from them. Kedward is found guilty of witchcraft, banished from the village during a particularly harsh winter, and presumed dead. Now if we click on this, we have information about the Blair Witch. And this was the world building that the Blair Witch Project film was really based on. This website answered so many questions and went into so much detail that the film never even fully gathered. So we have an early woodcut depicting the banishment of Ellie Kedward from the town of Blair. We have this clip. You, you've heard of the Blair Witch? Several times. Several times. And what was the first incident? incident well, I've heard, you... I've heard stories about her from people and neighbors and stuff like that. But also I saw a documentary on the Discovery Channel or somewhere. Really? Once that about her, deep. about the ghosts really? and legends of Maryland. Now, a lot of these interviews and kind of sound bites that we're going to get through the website are, in fact, in the Blair Witch movie. And you know that we are done with the section when it doesn't move forward anymore. So we're going to go back to the timeline. In November of 1786, by midwinter, all of Kedward's accusers, along with half the town's children, vanish. Fearing a curse, the townspeople flee Blair and vow to never utter Ellie Kedward's name again. In November of 1809, we have a pretty big shift in years, about 20, 20 some odd years, we have the book The Blair Witch Cult. So what is the Blair Witch Cult? Well, it was a rare book, commonly considered 
fiction that tells of an entire town cursed by an outcast witch. Now if we look in this, we have the only existing copy of the Blair Witch Cult on display at the Maryland Historical Society Museum in Baltimore in 1991. It has since been returned to a private collection. Published in 1809, the original copy of the Blair Witch Cult is badly damaged, with little of the writing still legible. Below are excerpts from parts of the book that can still be read. It was testified that at the examination of prisoner Kedward before the magistrates, the bewitched was extremely tortured, which was whipped with iron rods to compel her the rento. <laughs> uh, about sunrise, he was in his chamber, assaulted by the shape of the prisoner, which looked on him, grinned at him, and very much hurt him with a blow on the side. And Shape walked in the room where he was, and a book strangely flew out of his hand into the dot 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 six or eight foot in front of him. So apparently, this is uh, from this Blair Witch cult novel, which so much of it has been lost to time. So um, they're paraphrasing as best as possible. But so far, what what we're gathering from this excerpt is that the Blair Witch has come back and she is pissed. He waked on a night and saw a plainly woman between the cradle and the bedside, which looked upon him. He rose and it vanished, though he found the doors all fast. He saw the same woman in the same garb again and said, in God's name, what do you come for? The child in the cradle gave a great screech and the woman disappeared blood was and then it cuts off there with the doors shut about him he saw a black thing jump in at the window and come and stand before him the body was like that of a monkey the feet like a horse but the face much like a man the day after upon inspection hair of a horse lay in dot 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 did in the holes of the said old wall find several poppets made up of sticks and rags and hogs bristles and then it cuts off there now poppets are um they're they're commonly associated with hoodoo or voodoo uh think like a voodoo doll and that's kind of in the same frame of what a poppet could be now you could tie someone to a poppet um and wish things upon it at least this is from my understanding of what i've read about modern day poppets in witchcraft today basically tie them to someone tether them to someone tether them to yourself things like that so that's what they would have found now here it's talking about how ellie kedward tormented them biting pricking pinching pinching not pinching <laughs> and choking them uh this poor child is bewitched and you have a neighbor living not far off who is a witch. So it's just talking about her testimony, her trial, all of that. Um, this next page, we have a supposed um, page from the Blair Witch Cult book. She controlled the animals of the forest, even the trees seeming to do her bidding. And now we have an excerpt from Bill Baines, the executive director of Burkittsville Historical Society, discussing the Blair Witch Cult book. But it was about the Blair Witch and a pretty true, pretty factual book about what really happened here. But the Maryland Historical Society wanted it back and they took it over, almost over my dead body. But I couldn't keep it because it did belong to them. Another excerpt from Professor Charles Morehouse, the professor of folklore, discussing the Blair Witch cult book. And the book is, is filled with uh, bloodletting, uh, all kinds of bloody gore, witchcraft, paganism. Uh, basically, it's a pack of lies. Don't believe any of it. But the people of the, uh, of the time did believe in it. Okay, so my camera died, my AirPods died, my laptop died, then I was on the phone with my friend Corpse for like half an hour. This video is falling apart. So, another little snippet interview about this. And this is all just to verify its legitimacy, again, to kind of like draw you into the story. So then in 1824, Burkittsville itself, uh, population 194, is located in Frederick County, Maryland. And this year it was officially founded in Blair. We have a photo here of Main Street, Burkittsville, um, downtown Burkittsville. We have some interviews about Burkittsville. And you know what? Fascinating stuff. However, there's a lot to get through here, so we're gonna skip over a lot of it. August 1825, 11 witnesses testified to seeing a pale woman's hand reach up and pull 10 year old Aline Treacle into Tappy East Creek. Her body is never recovered, and for 13 days after the drowning, 
The creek is clogged with oily bundles of sticks. So clicking here, we are taken to Tappy East Creek in present day. This is the same section where Aline Treacle disappeared. And then we have Bill Baines, executive director of the Burkittsville Historical Society, discussing the incident at Tappy East Creek. After that, the people wouldn't even go near the creek. They wouldn't fish in it, they didn't swim in it, they didn't do anything in it because it just scared them completely to death and they blamed that on the the Blair Witch. Back to the timeline between November 1940 and May 1941. Starting with Emily Hollins, a total of seven children are abducted from the area surrounding Burgettsville, Maryland. May 25th, 1941. An old hermit named Rustin Parr walks into a local market and tells the people that he is finally finished. After police hike for four hours to his secluded house in the woods, they find the bodies of seven missing children in the cellar. Each child has been ritualistically murdered and disemboweled. Parr admits to everything in detail, telling authorities that he did it for an old woman ghost who occupies the woods near his house. He is quickly convicted and hanged. And we have um, clips that I saw in the Blair Witch Project movie uh, of a local talking about Rustin. Um, we also have a brief description and kind of like biography. Rustin Parr was 38 years old in 1940. He had lived in Frederick County, Maryland all his life. He didn't go to school much. Both his parents were dead before he was 10 years old. That's when Rustin moved to Burkittsville to live with his aunt and uncle. His uncle was pretty abusive, but he was a carpenter and he taught everything, he taught Rustin everything he knew. He liked Burkittsville a lot. The woods that surrounded the town were great to get away from everyone and be by himself. He always liked to be by himself. That's why it wasn't much of a surprise when Rustin decided to build a house up in the hillside, a four hour walk from town. He was in his early 20s and it took him almost five years to finish the house. It was a beautiful three story home next to a creek. Rustin continued to work at his uncle's shop for a few more years, but little by little, he began to come into the town less and less. Then his aunt died and his uncle moved to Baltimore. There wasn't much of a reason to go back anymore. He lived in that house ever since. He lived a peaceful life, smoking his pipe and taking long walks into the woods. Rustin was happy. He loved nature and the animals all around him. He only went into town about twice a year to pick up supplies. And then we have uh, him taking questions here from reporters. Why did you do it, Mr. Paul? I heard voices in my head. So, as the legend would have us believe, Rustin was totally normal, just this kind of hermit man living in the woods until the Blair Witch got to him. So Rustin can't remember exactly when, but it seemed to be a few years before the killing that he started seeing a figure in the woods, sometimes during his long walks. He would call out to it, but it would disappear. He soon realized that it was a woman, though she never showed her face to him. She wore a long, dark, hooded cloak. Rustin never felt fear when he saw the woman. He just wondered who she was. Every time he would run after her, she would vanish. Then that winter, Rustin began to hear a voice in his head. At first, it was at night, and he thought they were dreams. But he soon started to hear that voice during his waking hours, and that's when he began to be afraid. The voice was an old woman, and she would say all kinds of things in many strange languages. Sometimes she would repeat words over and over again. Rustin never saw the woman in the woods ever again, but this voice lived in his head for quite a while. After almost a year of this voice, Rustin had lost most of his senses. The voice began to tell him to do things, and he found himself doing them. At first they were meaningless, like sleeping in the cellar for a week at a time. Then in November of 1940, she told him to go down to Burkittsville and get the first two children he saw. For some reason, he found himself unable to resist. Actually, unwilling to resist. He followed the voice's directions completely, even when it began instructing him to take more children from the town of Burkittsville and kill them. In all, Rustin killed seven children, sparing only one, Kyle Brody, a boy who was made to stand in the corner while Rustin performed the awful act in the cellar of his house. After the seventh child was killed, Rustin woke up and the cloaked figure was in his room. He couldn't see it clearly in the dark, but he knew who it was. She spoke to him in the same horrible voice that had haunted his head for more than a year now. She told him that he was finished and that he was to go to town the next day and tell everyone what he had done. She said that she would leave him alone if he did this. Then the figure disappeared and Rustin Parr never saw the woman again. The next day Rustin woke up and released Kyle. 
He cried for the first time ever when he saw the poor boy that morning. Rustin then slowly walked into town, went into a market, and began saying, I'm finally finished. The police followed him up to his house and found Kyle standing on the front porch, looking dazed and unable to speak. They then found the bodies of the seven little children in seven graves in the cellar of the house. Rustin was arrested and convicted of the deaths. The voice did stop in Rustin's head. He didn't know who the cloaked woman was, but he did know that she was the old, she was an old ghost of some kind. He was positive that this woman was not alive. He was truly sorry for what he did, but at the same time incredibly glad that this woman was out of his head. Kyle Brody never recovered from the two months in Parr's house. He would live an institutionalized life until his death in 1971. He was present on the day of Parr's verdict in court and cried when the jury convicted the hermit. Uh, Russ and Parr died in the fall of 1941. So that's heavy, but that is uh, the killings of 1941. And if you've watched The Blair Witch, if you haven't, I'll kind of like catch you up to speed. No real spoilers here. Basically, the witch would strike every 50 some odd years. So this was the great murder spree of 1941, supposedly, but they did not go into this detail in the film, of course. We have the front page of the November 22nd, 1941 issue of the Washington Press, which covers the Rustin Parr case. We have more coverage, child killer hanged. Um, we have some questions from reporters before his execution. How long have you lived in the woods, Mr. Parr? All my life. How did you kill the children, Mr. Parr? With knives. Mr. Parr, were you alone in the killings? Yes. Mr. Parr, how did you get the children into the woods? Promised and things. What kind of thing, Mr. Parr? Candy. Did you kill other children that we don't know about, Mr. Parr? No. Over here, Mr. Parr. Mr. Parr, why those seven children? That's what the voice is telling me. Mr. Parr, the writings on the wall in their house, what do they mean? What were the writings on the wall, Mr. Parr? Did you write those? Did you write on the walls? No. We have a few more here in this other clip. Mr. Parr, you've been sentenced to death. Do you feel this is fair? Yes. Mr. Parr, do you think God has forgiven you? Yes. Have you asked a priest for absolution? Yes. Have members of your family been deceived? No. Mr. Parr, have you been in contact with the family of the children you killed? No. Mr. Parr, do you have any words for the families of the slain? No. All right, guys, that's enough. Interview's over. Mr. Paul, was it Satan? Mr. Paul, was it the Blair Witch? Mr. Paul, one more picture, please. I said that's enough. Mr. Paul, why did you do it? So you can hear in the audience reporters even asking then if it was the Blair Witch. Um, we have a photo here of Kyle Brody, the only abducted child by Rustin Parr who lived. Um, the mugshot taken after Rustin Parr's arrest a clip uh, from a newsreel showing him in prison. And I think this is just a quick silent clip showing him in jail. Okay, so that's it for 1941. The first, not the first, but the most recent killing of the Blair Witch at this time. We jump all the way forward to October 20th of 1994, which I would have been one year old and that would have been my dad's birthday that year. Montgomery College students Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams and we will come back to them when we look at the filmmakers. They arrive in Burkittsville to interview locals about the legend of the Blair Witch for a class project. Heather interviews Mary Brown, an old and quite insane woman who has lived in the area all her life. Mary claims to have seen the Blair Witch one day near Tappy Creek in the form of a hairy, half-human, half-animal beast. And honestly, when you consult the Blair Witch cult book that we kind of looked at earlier, that's sort of what the book described the Blair Witch as. Um, these clips are actually from the movie, so I'm not going to play them. I'm a little bit scared of getting copyright claimed. In the early morning, Heather interviews two fishermen. Again, that interview is also in the film, uh, who tells filmmakers that Coffin Rock is less than 20 minutes from town and easily accessible by an old logging trail. The filmmakers hike into Black Hills Forest shortly thereafter and are never seen again. Now again, that is in 
the film, but if you're looking at this from an outsider's perspective, back in the late 90s, all of this looks totally real and you have no context of, oh, this isn't a film, this is obviously fictional. People are seeing these interviews, this footage, and they're like, what is going on and how did I miss all of this happening? October 25th, 1994, the first APB is issued. Uh, Josh, one of the filmmakers, car, is found a day later parked on Black Rock Road. Um, October 26th, the Maryland State Police uh, launched their search in this area. It lasts for 10 days and includes up to 100 men aided by dogs, helicopters, and even a flyover by a Department of Defense satellite. The search is called off after 33,000 man hours, the 10 days later. So these are professionals looking in the woods and they can't find these students. So Heather's mother, Angie, uh, begins an exhaustive personal search for her daughter and her two companions. On June 19th of 1995, the case is declared inactive and unsolved. October 16th, 1995, students from University of Maryland's anthropology department find a duffel bag containing film cans, DAT tapes, video cassettes, a Hi8 video camera, Heather's journal, and a CP16 film camera buried under the foundation of a 100-year-old cabin. When the evidence is examined, Burkittsville Sheriff Ron Cravens announced that the 11 rolls of black and white film and 10 HI8 videotapes are indeed the property of Heather Donahue and the crew. So for following the story, this is supposedly what happens after the film. The film happened in this very brief period between uh, October 21st when they head into the woods on October 25th when the first APB is issued and they find Josh's car. So October 16th, 1995, a full year later, these films, this footage that had been created in the woods is found under an old cabin. And so, December 15th, 1995, after an initial study of the bag's contents, select pieces of film footage are shown to the families. According to Angie Donahue, there are several unusual events, but nothing conclusive. The families question the thoroughness of the analysis and demand another look. February 19th, 1996, the families are shown a second group of clips that local law enforcement consider to be faked. Outraged, Mrs. Donahue goes public with her criticism and Sheriff Cravens restricts all access to evidence, a restriction that two lawsuits fail to lift. So March 1st, 1996, the sheriff is finally like, hey, this is inconclusive. We can't solve this case. And so all of this footage will be released to the families when the legal limit of its classification runs out on October 16th, 1997. On that date, the found footage of their children's last days is turned over to the parents of the children. I say children, but they were grown adults in college, but you get it. Then Angie, the mother of Heather, contacts Hackson, Hackson Films to examine the footage and piece together the events of October 20th through the 28th, 1994. So that was a long timeline. That took us a lot of time to go through and that's really just one fourth of the website. This was the most thorough portion, so I really wanted to spend a lot of our time here. But once again, this site garnered so many people who were coming across it, perhaps through word of mouth or forums, much like there were back in the 90s. And people were like, what is this? Why is this website with all of this information here? What is the Blair Witch? They're, they're believing that it's real. This is how the Blair Witch fooled an entire population just 20 years ago. Really think about that. How now we see people fully like losing their minds and getting kidnapped on camera. Let's look back at Ash Vlogs when there were hours of footage being streamed onto YouTube, just hours and hours of footage of supposed kidnappings and we all just brush that aside because it is just another viral scary story. It's just another ARG. This wasn't normal back then. So when we go to the filmmakers, we have Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams, the three filmmakers who were conducting uh, basically a project of Heather's producing in the woods in hopes of finding evidence of the Blair Witch. Under Heather, we have various photos here. Um, we have just like stuff of her at college, senior prom. Same with Josh. We just have little, little bits and pieces of them. And it also has, if you keep scrolling here, little biographies 
of them. So they had all written a biography to go with this project. Then we go to the aftermath, and here we have four subsections. The evidence, we have the search, the interviews, and the news. A lot of the interviews are things that were found in the film, but again, this is what really fooled people back in the 90s who were stumbling across this website and they were like, there are so many interviews about these missing people, of course it's gotta be real. We have Josh's car when it was discovered by police. Um, part one of the evidence videos, there are several evidence videos that I'll show you here. Could you uh, open up the one just to... This one's labeled as day five. Okay, so we had a total of five of those over, over five days. Right. And this one here is unopened. This one is. Okay. All right, then we've got... Uh, we 11 videotapes. Okay, and now we've got... Right 11 film canisters, all still taped. And these are... Um, assumed to have been exposed. We'll photograph the pages of the journal later. All right, I'll take those. These have not been developed yet, and they've assumed to have been exposed. And they're going to the lab to process. And when are they going? So evidence of the filmmaker's duffel bag containing films, dat tapes, video cassettes, and a Hi8 camera. Uh, Heather's journal, which we will get into, and CP16 film camera. They found the bag buried under a foundation of a 100-year-old cabin. And here we have the anthology, anthropology, anthology, <laughs> anthropology professor David Mercer explaining how there is no scientific explanation for how the backpack was buried. This uh, backpack was found in, in a sterile soil, which is like the bottom of the site, it's just, you know, from there to the middle of the earth is just dirt. Uh, the original house at the site had burned down, and so there was a layer of ash that was like sitting in, in the interior of the house, like the basement. So this, this knapsack had been in sterile soil uh, with no evidence around it of disturbance. Along, over the top of it was an undisturbed layer of ash, and the whole thing was boxed in by uh, uh, basically a colonial era wall uh, that was undisturbed. I, even a forensic expert could not have put that thing into the site without disturbing the charcoal, the wall, or sterile soil. Um, it was as if it materialized. And, and of course, that's not the language of science, so I can't, I, I just don't know what to say about this, really. Okay. So we have a professor, a professor of anthropology, saying that there is no way that this could have just been there, and yet it was there. We also have um, an interview with the private investigator, Buck Buchanan, but let's move on to search. Uh, and this details the search for the three missing people, Heather, Josh, and Michael, um, that was issued throughout Fredericks County following the filmmaker's disappearance. The police here continue their search for the filmmakers. Angie Donahue posted hundreds of missing persons posters in the Burkittsville area following the disappearance of her daughter. A little bit more uh, here with David Mercer talking about how it was impossible, basically it was just impossible where the bag was buried. Um, then we have some stuff from the sheriff, the private investigator, who they're just talking about like, listen, we've sunk 33,000 man hours into this. We can't find these kids. It doesn't make any sense. Under interviews, there's a ton of videos. We could be here all day looking at it. From channel 11, Teresa Serio, Serio herself interviewing Deputy Hart and volunteer rescuer Bill Combs as they're looking for the kids. Good evening. The search of the three missing Montgomery College students continues in Frederick County tonight as dozens of volunteers and state officials join local forces in what has now become a full-scale search of the Black Hills area. That's right, Frank. The turnout here has been really overwhelming as dozens of volunteers from all over the area have come here to help find these students. We have here with us now Deputy Hart, who has been leading today's operations. Deputy Hart, what do you think of this turnout? Well, it's been a long day, but we've got a uh, great turnout from the Tri-County area. We've got uh, uh, school children and uh, church volunteers, and uh, so we've covered quite a bit of ground with them. So people are seeing these interviews, this news coverage. I mean, you're seeing it here on the site. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> this is real. Then we look at the legacy. And here's kind of the last chunk of this video. We have the discovered footage, the audio, and Heather's journal. Most of this 
it's almost like the film's way of providing you with teaser trailers. I mean, you're looking at this and a lot of these little clips, that's like Heather heading into the woods with all of her packing gear. That's a very familiar quick scene to you if you ever watched The Blair Witch. Some of the things are clickable, some of them are not, to almost give you the impression that there's more here than there is. And there is a ton here, don't get me wrong. We have some audio files here, nothing too interesting. Again, just all little clips from the um, film itself and mostly the, the students fighting about the project. <laughs> but then we have Heather's journal. And my God, does Heather's journal provide a fascinating chunk of information. This is Heather Donahue's journal discovered under the 100 year old cabin in the woods where it physically could not be. So we get a lot of photos here, but what's more interesting is just how much information we wind up getting from the journal. And as it's Heather's journal, a lot of this really doesn't have to do with the spook factor. A lot of it is just kind of world building. and. Time is not kind to a lot of things and websites is one of them. So you're gonna notice like this sort of little symbol here where uh, photos are no longer available essentially. But in every other space, you can see little pictures are included for reference. And we just have stuff leading all the way up to the incident, all the way up to the disappearance. Here on October 20th of that year, excellent day of shooting, a horrible night of fighting. Uh, trust is essential for this project. I need these guys. They need a project to work on. Maybe I am drifting from reality is how that journal entry ends. Starting on page 16, they are going to the woods. We are not at home. Everyone freaked out today. I am sure I know where the car is. It's just taking longer than I thought. We have all sorts of information from when they were in the woods. Heather says filthy, stinky, exhausted. They're fighting all the time. Um, we are not at home. Everyone freaked out today. I am sure I know where the car is. It's just taking longer than I thought. I don't know. Pretty much everything that happens I tape and writing uses light and light uses batteries. Batteries are money. I still feel a little lonely but we'll be going home tomorrow so I'll be fine again. The hardest thing about directing is dealing with people. It almost seems if the smaller the number of people, the harder it is because you're with them all the time. I truly like these guys. Mike has turned out to be so incredibly cool and Josh, well, Josh, he's always a surprise. Then again, he always works hard as well as being hard to work with on occasion. Gaining their trust and respect has been my biggest issue all along. I'm so different from them aside from just gender, but it makes it difficult sometimes for us to relate to each other and communicate clearly. We heard stuff again. So at 3 a.m., we heard stuff again. This time they thought it was a deer. I think it's because they fear that if they say definitively, it is something tangible and earthly. They cannot for a second admit the possibility that it is the Blair Witch. I'm not saying it is. I'm only saying it's possible. I was very calm tonight, so I don't have to go through another day of mending fragile crew egos because I need to get my film shot. They followed anyway. Could it be that they sometimes do listen? On page 21, Heather discusses how they are completely lost. She is hungry and cold. She wants to see what they shot. They didn't light a campfire tonight because they want to lay low. And yet, as scared as she is, she wants to know what it is following them through the woods. The writing gets more and more frantic and exhausted and tired as these pages go on. On page 28 and page 29, she explains that Josh is gone. It's just her and Mike now, alone. I question why I still continue to film. It seems sick almost. Who will see the footage? Will I? Still plenty of battery power. I've been carrying it on my back for a week now, so I might as well use it. I am losing hope. Actually, I may have lost it. I didn't think it was possible to be where I'm at. Staring. Waiting. I have nothing left to say. Tape, tape. Film, film, film. We're being stalked, and whatever is stalking us will at least be documented. Please, God, let someone find our tapes. Please. To all the people I love, and you know who you are, I love you. Simply that. I love you with all my heart and more. If something bad happens to me, I will always find you. And I will always look out for you and help in any way I can. As I sincerely try to do in my life. To Josh and Mike's parents, I am sorry. I'm sorry for what happened to your sons and to my beautiful baby cakes. I will love no matter where I am. I lack the strength to hold a pen. Hey, those last two lines rhyme. Why even now? That really, it's obvious, but anything that brings humor is welcome, especially now. I want to laugh. 
I want to laugh. I want to laugh. And that's it. And that was the exhausted look that I wanted to do with you all tonight into the Blair Witch website. A bit of backstory on what is the Blair Witch cult. What's funny is while this video is titled The Blair Witch Cult, and that was a very brief part of the video, the book itself, the Blair Witch Cult is all too real. This movie had a cult following because of this website along with so many other factors. It really revolutionized horror and the way that we view it. It's not a particularly scary movie as I learned the other night when I watched it. If anything, a bit creepy and a bit more startling to look back on once you've stepped away from it. But the world building, the amount of time that they spent depicting the Blair Witch, giving her this curse, these bits of footage showing this murderer, Rustin Parr, in jail, I mean, it, there was no end to the amount of building that they did on this website. One of the first original ARGs, one of the first original viral scary stories, and I hope that you guys enjoyed this little look into it tonight. It was something a little bit different, but I hope you enjoyed nonetheless. If you did, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I love you very much, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!